Hi everyone, in this video we'll be covering the principles of restoring root treated teeth, talking about posts, cuspal coverage, core materials and answering a question that's frequently asked which is how long do we wait before restoring root treated teeth. So just before we get started, we'd like to thank Dr. Kushal Gardia, who is a consultant in restorative dentistry and a specialist in periodontology, prosthodontics, endodontics, restorative dentistry, and has a special interest in dental implantology. Dr. Gardia has been kind enough to provide this content from ACE courses, and while this video is only a summary, the full webinar is available for students completely free of charge on his ACE courses website. Root treated teeth are more brittle and access cavities weaken teeth depending on how much tooth tissue has been lost. You have about a 20% weakening if the occlusal surface has been lost, a 40% weakening if you've lost mesial buccal or distal occlusal surfaces, and a 60% weakening for an MOD. This varies based on the extent of the ridge lost. If the functional cusp has been lost, or if the patient has a parafunctional habit, we need to do something to restore the strength at the end of the root canal treatment. The more dentine that is lost, the more likely that a root filled tooth will fracture. It's also important to note that as you use irrigants during endodontic treatment, these irrigants change the physical properties of the teeth by decreasing the flexural strength of the dentine and increasing the brittleness. The survival of a tooth is reduced by five things. One, the loss of both marginal ridges. Two, if the tooth is used as an abutment tooth for a fixed or removable prosthesis, this, by the way, should not be done because we'll end up compromising the root treated tooth due to its inability to cope with as much load as a sound tooth. Three, if it's a molar. Four, narrow deep probing defects, which indicate the presence of a crack or a fracture. And finally, five, if there in fact is a crack. The more of these you have, the worse the prognosis for the tooth. The first principle we're going to be talking about is to preserve as much tooth structure as possible. So wherever you can, do an onlay instead of a crown. It is increasingly believed that the ability of a root filled tooth to resist a fracture is directly related to the amount of tooth tissue remaining. The more tooth tissue remaining, the less likely it is to fracture, but we should also be aiming to reduce the amount of stress that the tooth will endure. The second principle to discuss is about replacing the old restoration before carrying out your root canal treatment. If someone presents with a previous restoration, an MO, composite or amalgam, or a previous crown for example, and there's a need to root canal treat the tooth, you should remove the previous restoration even if it looks clinically and radiographically sound. The reason for this is there is a 65% chance that there is secondary caries present underneath. So you should remove the old restoration or the old crown instead of accessing through it clear the caries and then build it back up with good margins before starting your endo. The third principle we'll talk about is ensuring that the patient is pain-free before obturating, favoring doing endodontics over two appointments instead of one. So if your patient attends for your obturation appointment but they were still in pain, you should do more chemical debridement, put more medication down the canals close to the working length, temporize and send the patient away before reviewing them, ensuring they are symptom free before bringing them back in for obturation. The fourth principle is to provide a good coronal seal. There has been controversy over what is more important, the root canal treatment or the quality of the restoration afterwards. A 1995 study supports the claim that it's the restoration after which determines the prognosis of the tooth. You might have come across a patient with a not so great root treated tooth, but they'll tell you they've had no problems with the tooth for over 20 years. In this case, without any doubt, they would have had an amazing coronal seal. However, later in 2000, there was evidence to show that both a good root canal treatment and a high quality restoration were both important. That said, you should aim to do both well, but if for whatever reason the root canal treatment didn't go exactly as you would have liked, then it's really important to make sure that you've got that optimal coronal seal, otherwise the endo will just fail. The fifth principle we will speak about is the necessity of a ferrule. The 1.5 to 2 millimeters of coronal dentine all the way around the tooth and most importantly at the functional load bearing areas. Without the ferrule effect, the crown would have less resistance to fracture loads and will dislodge quite easily. For example, if a maxillary incisor which has a crown had forces occluding labially from an occluding mandibular incisor, the path of dislodgement would be in the labial direction. To reduce this, you should increase the ferrule on the palatal aspect of the upper incisor by preparing the surface equigingively instead of supragingively, and those extra couple millimeters will provide you with a significant difference in resisting those occluding forces. This way, it's still cleansable, but also provides you with the greatest amount of retention and resistance to those labial 
shape your forces, reducing the likelihood of dislodgement when the lower incisor is in function or when a person goes into anterior guidance. This is an example to help you visualize the importance of ferrule in the functional load-bearing areas especially. Now, let's move on to posts. For posts, three millimeters of root structure apically should improved fracture resistance for teeth restored with a post and core. It's important to note that posts serve no purpose other than to hold a core. They don't reinforce the teeth. Instead, they actually weaken them and long and parallel posts are generally better than tapered and screw posts. The ferrule of 1.5 to 2 millimeters is needed and the greater the height, the greater the resistance features that you will have with the crown. Posts can be prefabricated or cast in a lab. You would use a cast post if you wanted the post to be customized to the shape of the canal and this is beneficial when you have a really large canal and you want to limit dentine removal. With a prefabricated post on the other hand, you need to prepare the dentine in the canal to match it to the shape of the post. This can be really destructive, especially in larger canals. The disadvantage of using a cast post is that you'll need a temporary post while the lab makes your customized post and your temporary post can't provide the same hermetic coronal seal that a prefabricated post and core can provide. However, there are a couple ways to reduce the likelihood of the invasion of microorganisms during this temporization period while the lab fabricates your post. The first one is to cut back the GP two millimeters further than where you want your post to be and fill the canal with two millimeters of IRM. By doing this, you're creating an extra seal. The second thing is to do some immediate dentin sealing. We won't get into all the benefits of IDS today and hopefully we'll cover it in a future video. But for now, if you're unfamiliar with what IDS is, there's some great evidence-based content online that you should check out and we'll leave some links in the description for you to have a read. Very briefly, it's when you sign Sandblast, etch, prime and bond to seal the dentine instead of keeping the dentine exposed between the time that you temporize and fit the definitive restoration. So then do all root treated teeth need cuspal coverage? For anterior teeth, if the only tooth tissue lost is that of the access cavity or the access cavity and some proximal tissue, then a composite restoration would probably be sufficient. However, if there's an access cavity or multiple restorations or a very large restoration, then a full coverage crown would be needed. For premolar teeth, there's a bit of a gray area, but this should give you some guidance on what you should be doing depending on the presentation. Pause the screen to have a look. For molars, you should almost always be providing cuspal coverage. One scenario where you don't need to provide cuspal coverage is when you have a very conservative access and it's completely intact otherwise. And when we say very conservative here, we're referring to an optimal isthmus width of less than a third of the tooth tissue removed between the cusps. If there is any more than a third of the tooth tissue lost between the buccal and palatal cusp, or if there is a ridge or a cusp missing, then you will need cuspal coverage. This paper shows that root treated posterior teeth are six times more likely to be lost if they didn't have cuspal coverage as compared to if they did have cuspal coverage. So you can choose to place a Nyar core with amalgam or you can place a composite core and each have their advantages and disadvantages. For a Nyar core, you can prep two to four millimeters into the canal and again, use a two millimeter IRM plug, which will provide an extra seal in the canals beneath that Nyar core. However, an amalgam restoration will shine through. So if you're planning for an aesthetic restoration like an Emax crown, or if you intend on having a bonded restoration, it would be preferable to do it with a composite core. NG et al. in 2008 said that there are four things which significantly improve the outcome of primary root canal treatments and they are shown on the screen now. The fourth on the list is a final coronal restoration. We should all consider the immediate coronal seal as the final part of the root canal treatment and this links back to making sure that the patient is symptom free before obturating. It shouldn't be the case that you have obturated and the patient is still in pain and now you're waiting for them to get out of pain before doing the coronal seal. Instead, this coronal seal should be done immediately after the root canal treatment. Okay guys, we hope you guys found that video useful and if you did, we'd really appreciate if you gave this video a like and subscribe to our channel. There are more videos like this coming soon in line with the ACE Courses webinars created by Dr. Gardia. For the full webinar, make sure you check out the ACE Courses website which is completely free for students to use. There are lots of webinars on there on dentures, occlusion, tooth surface loss and much more. There's a link in the description to sign up if you haven't already and we'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.